everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Mike Posner. I'm at the uh, Stern uh, School of Business at NYU, um, where with my colleague Sarah Labowitz, who's here today, we are setting up, uh, we have set up a Center on Business and Human Rights. I think it's the first business school uh, to have such a center. And so I'm delighted to be here for this discussion. And we have a terrific panel. So I want to um, I want to just introduce the subject first, and then I'll introduce the panelists one at a time, and we will uh, have a, a good discussion. Um, I, I first want to say uh, 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 a word of appreciation to the uh, organizers of this conference. 1,700 people here, quite extraordinary. And it reflects, I think, the growing importance of these issues that so many of us are here. Uh, obviously, the work of the uh, working group is essential in carrying on uh, John Ruggie's uh, extraordinary uh, stay in, in uh, the UN, uh, the six years he spent uh, developing the guiding principles, really laid a, s a strong foundation for everything we're doing and saying. And uh, his perseverance, his uh, intelligence, the way he went about this, I think is a great tribute to him, but it's also a great tribute to the United Nations and to the various people in this room and in this conference um, who helped make the guiding principles a reality. The guiding principles really lay a foundation, and as uh, Professor Ruggi has said, um, we're now at the end of the beginning of the process. Um, they've laid a foundation where everybody now is talking about these issues in a way that's different, governments civil society and companies, but we're now at a place where we need to get to the middle. And the middle means trying to figure out how to implement the guiding principles. And so I think our panel today and the panels uh, going on simultaneously really look at uh, this question of implementation. What does it mean to say a duty to protect for states? What does it mean to say responsibility? to respect for companies, and what does it mean when we talk about remedies? That's really what we're going to talk about here this morning. And a couple of thoughts just on, the, on that uh, three-part uh, uh, principle, uh, guiding principle formula. I think we all recognize that at the end of the day, the duty of states to protect is paramount. Um, we want to live in a world where 193 states um, all uh, have functioning democratic governments where there's respect for the rule of law, where women are empowered, where unions are allowed to operate, where civil society is active, where the internet is free, where the press is free. Um, we don't live in that world. And so the reality is, as much as people will say, and we should say, our, dry, our overriding ambition is to create a global order where every government is protecting the rights of its own people, we, we have a governance gap now. And the governance gap is amplified by the fact that companies, large companies and small, have assumed a greater uh, power in this world, greater authority and influence, and often you have very large companies operating in places where states are weak. And so that puts more of a focus on the relationship between uh, the corporate sector, companies, the private sector, and states where there is this governance gap. And there are various ways to go about addressing this, but one of those ways is the multi-stakeholder approach. And again, we're going to talk about this from different perspectives. Uh, one thing I would say just as an observation, um, it is striking that in this meeting where so many people are here from so many civil society organizations, government well represented, academic community, that we have a relatively small percentage of companies here. And when you talk about multi-stakeholder, companies need to be part of that process. We don't have anybody on this panel from a company, and that's, that's a, a challenge to us. So we're going to have to compensate by trying to identify what are some of the things that companies might be saying on this panel. It's also striking to me, and I was uh, a couple of weeks ago at a meeting of the World Economic Forum uh, councils in Abu Dhabi, it, stri it was very striking there uh, that there were almost no union representatives. And it's striking again here today, and I'm thrilled that Christy Hoffman is here. But I think unions represent 
one or two percent of the 1,700 people here. So one of the things we ought to be asking ourselves is how do we have this discussion of multi-stakeholder when companies and unions, two key uh, pieces of the puzzle, are underrepresented in our midst. Just a couple of quick thoughts to finally uh, stop talking about multi-stakeholder initiatives. There are a couple of things that I would say are critical when we talk about these initiatives. First of all, we recognize they're not the solution. We're in an interim period. Again, we've, we've ended the beginning. We're now in the middle period of implementation, and there are multiple strategies for getting to the next level as we move to create those 193 democratic states. One of the options is a multi-stakeholder initiative, and several things I think are part of what makes a multi-stakeholder discussion meaningful. One is that there be a governance structure that is itself multi-stakeholder. There need to be businesses, civil society, other stakeholders that are part of deciding the rules for the multi-stakeholder efforts. Uh, secondly, I think there need to be clear standards. Um, it's not... Uh, possible to have a meaningful discussion about an industry and what it ought to be doing if there aren't rules of the road. So the question, again, in a multi-stakeholder context is how do you figure out what those rules are? And then secondly, how do you figure out how to implement them? What are the metrics? What are the evaluative tools to make judgments? And then finally, coming to Professor Ruggie's third point in the guiding principles, there has to be a remedy when there's noncompliance. We have to look at this issue of accountability. So with those opening thoughts, I want to uh, open up and welcome our panel. I want to start uh, uh, by introducing Peter McAllister, who's the director of the Ethical Trading Initiative and who spent 20 years both in development and rights-oriented work, now with uh, Ethical Trading and previously with the COCO initiatives here in Geneva. Um, Peter, we're delighted to have you here. I'm going to push all of our panelists to take seven minutes and stop, and then our two discussants, and then we'll open up for discussion. So, Peter, why don't you lead off? Thank you. Mike, is that on? Yes, yeah. Um, thank you, and um, thank you to the organizers again for hosting this and inviting um, me along to speak on behalf of MSI. So obviously, I'll speak more about ETI, but there are a lot of common characteristics, I think, that, that you find in MSI, so hopefully some of this will resonate. Um, the advent of the guiding principles has been both a real benefit for us in the sense of offering a framework for which in we, within which we can work, but also I think it highlights some of the work that MSIs have been doing for a number of years that really can contribute to the way that the guiding principles can be executed. So I'll try and pinpoint a couple of um, examples around that as we go forward. So what is ETI? We are an alliance of some 80 companies, uh, US, European, UK companies, uh, we have global trade unions around our uh, table and 15 NGOs. So we are a tripartite organization, which sometimes causes lots of fun, but is really at the essence of why the debate around the ETI table can be quite unique. We're guided by a code we call the ETI base code, but it's drawn from the ILO convention. So many MSI codes will be drawn from the same origins. Um, MSIs like ETI have been working with companies for give or take 15 years now to identify human rights issues, find solutions to them, and expose companies to different perspectives and different voices. So as I say, the advent of the RUGGY framework for us is a fantastic international framework within which we can place our work. So in the, in the um, guiding principles, there is a clear call to the role of business. Um, however, businesses are not specialists in human rights. It is quite normal for a business to have partnerships around R&D, around financial structuring, around uh, consultancy on strategy. Um, so it should be quite natural for companies to seek out uh, informed advice on human rights issues. And I think that's key. I hear still far too many conversations between businesses and their lawyers talking about being compliant with RUGGY, in which case it seems to me they miss the point. This is actually about a journey rather than about documentation. So it's really important in something as strategic as this that business is looking to find the right partners. Um, there are many things which are obvious, but there are also things which are very blind even to the NGO world and the multi-stakeholder world, but particularly to business. Vulnerable populations, migrant groups, types of workers within supply chains, um, unintended impacts of your business operations or your products. 
So again, I would say it's really important business talks to a variety um, of different partners as they start to understand the human rights impacts of their business. A simple example from ATI's experience was the presence of home workers in India uh, doing a lot of embroidery work on fashion garments and they were not considered part of the supply chain. They were completely invisible, yet they were there, they were being exploited, they were not being paid properly, they were working for pittance. And so ETI has worked with its companies, with NGOs, with trade unions, has helped shine a light on those workers and bring them into the supply chain and start the conversations around well, where's the fair value? How do you make sure that they are treated better, that they are in, an, in a formal economy rather than an informal economy? I wouldn't say we've solved all those problems, but we've started now to bring that human rights issue into the frame and into company conversations. Um, as you know, the key areas of action for business are to do the relevant policy work, to do the due diligence processes, to look at um, remediation. And I would say that that is, again, an area where companies clearly have some strengths but would benefit from some exposure to other ideas. Particularly, the multi-stakeholder environment offers a place where human rights issues which are not individual company specific can be tackled. So Christy will talk about Rana Plaza in a minute, which is a very good example of a, an endemic issue in a sourcing country. But there are plenty of other issues which are sector specific or region specific and not company specific. Multi-stakeholders offer that place to talk about those. So for example, ETI is currently working with a number of uh, companies on looking at the, um, the prawn uh, supply chain out of Thailand. Very, very complex issues, very, very complex stakeholders. Starting the journey with those companies to better understand those supply chains, involve the ILO, involve the Thai government, and start to have the conversations around how do we move from a situation of largely ignorance of human rights abuses to tackling human rights abuses. Um, MSIs have a, have a set of core competencies which I think lend themselves well to the ruggy environment. We're good at convening. We're good at bringing companies together with people who they're not necessarily familiar with. We expose them to trade union perspectives on their world, to different NGO perspectives on their world. It's a challenging environment and it's not always comfortable, but nor should it be given the issues we're dealing with. So I think NGO, uh, MSIs have that inherent ability to create that space to discuss things. And when we do that well, it's a space where companies feel a level of comfort and trust. It's difficult for companies, and I think one of the reasons we don't find them at these events often enough is they feel exposed individually. Whereas if you can put them in an environment where you can have those tough conversations within a set of rules, you can start to expose the issues. So MSIs and the UN Garden Principles, I think ETI has already demonstrated and other MSIs that we can provide an, an environment for helping look at policy. We can most certainly be an environment for helping to identify the human rights abuses. Now ETI is limited to workers' rights and there's clearly a much wider uh, much wider canvas. But that environment, that relatively safe environment for companies to be challenged and encouraged or to go on a journey. Again, recent example, we took companies to Peru and helped them better understand the human rights abuses happening in the Peruvian horticulture sector. They were kicking and screaming a bit, if I'm honest, but once they got there and started to understand how that supply chain works and some of the inherent abuses, they were grateful that they've started to do this, not in the media, not because of public campaign, but in a space where they can start to consider their responses. And, and lastly, the remediation piece. Clearly, companies need to take that responsibility, but often they're not the, the, the deliverer or the service provider. So working with NGOs, working with trade unions to make sure there are appropriate remediation mechanisms and remediation services in place is a very valuable role that MSIs can play. So I, I will stop there because I think you're going to hear some specific examples, and I would certainly like to, to hear um, both critique and um, questions from the floor as we go forward about how we can expand that role and how we can build on some of the experiences that MSIs have had. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. That's very helpful Our next uh, panelist is Christy Hoffman, who's the Deputy Secretary General of uh, Uni Global Union, uh, which is a union of uh, about 900 affiliates uh, with, uh, in 140 countries, 20 million members, one of the most important voices in the trade union movement globally. Um, Chris, as you, uh, I'm sure you have things you want to say, but I want to ask you also to speak to two points. One is, um, wh what would it take to bring, to get more um, union representation at a meeting like this? What's, what, what is the reason that so few people are coming? 
And what would make this sort of a form more uh, interesting to people and more uh, relevant to people in the union movement? Second thing I'd like to ask you is about the uh, accord. I'm, I'm sure you're going to speak about this, and, and, uh, and Peter mentioned it. Um, this is a kind of interesting multi-stakeholder initiative. For years, my own experience has been that the union uh, movement has been leery of multi-stakeholder initiatives. Now you're right in the middle of one. And I'd love you to sort of comment about, does this reflect a broader philosophical change? Um, is this a one-of experience because of Bangladesh and Rana Plaza? And what are some of the strengths and weaknesses you see of the accord? How well is it working? Uh, people, if there's seats up front, if any of you in the back want to come, there's a whole row of seats that are empty. Please, Christy, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm more than happy to uh, speak today about the accord as a, uh, as Michael says, an interesting multi-stakeholder. We actually even have a debate within the accord as to whether we should use that name uh, as, ref as applied to the accord. So, um, but. Um, I will uh, speak to that today as an example of um, certainly unions, NGOs, and um, employers uh, working together to find a solution where there is an extreme governance gap in Bangladesh as evidenced by the horrible tragedies leading to thousands of deaths from building collapses and fires over the past years. Um, I, let me just first um, explain why uni is in the frame here. We represent uh, service workers around the world, 20 million workers, but the lo a largest sector, sector within uni are commerce retail workers. And through those uh, unions and our work with multinationals, we have relationships with many of the global brands and retailers who source in Bangladesh. Um, and so that's what brought us to the table. We don't normally represent factory workers. And in fact, we, we don't represent the workers in the factories in Bangladesh. The accord itself uh, is, I'll describe a little bit just so we understand the context. It's a, an agreement that to which one, almost 120 brands and retailers are signatory at this point. We launched it in May 15th, uh, so only about six months ago. It now covers 1,800 of the 3,500 export factories in Bangladesh. Um, signatory are, we have two global unions that are also signatory, uni and industrial, as well as some, and four NGOs that have a special status as witness signatories. Um, we're, we're govern, our governance, I just want to review some of these points because these are issues that Michael brought up in his introduction about what makes these organizations tick. We have a six person steering committee, three labor, three uh, companies, uh, very, very small. Um, and with the uh, NGOs having some uh, status as observers, and we have an advisory committee based in Bangladesh. So what makes the accord um, different fundamentally is, and what uh, certainly inspires unions to be involved in the accord or anything like it, is it's very familiar territory for us in that each signatory has a bilateral contract with uni and industry all. So in some sense, I come from the labor movement. I've been negotiating collective agreements with employers my whole life since I was 25. This is very familiar uh, work. Um, it, it has been misinterpreted in the press um, that, um, but in fact, it is, it is uh, there are a series of bilateral contracts to which we all commit to create an organization to implement the agreements within it. Um, so in that sense, it's not really voluntary once signed. It is, of course, voluntary to sign the agreement, but once signed, we do have some binding commitments. And so it's not intended in the classic sense as we're here to share ideas and best practices and aspirational. It really is like we're here to get the job done. Um, the theory of the accord is that the brands use their influence with the factories from which they source to ensure that the, there is respect for the human rights of the employees to work in a safe environment. And in that regard, it intends to implement, to support the implementation of the guiding principles. Um, but I would stress the employer relationship remains with the factory, not with the signatories to the accord. Uh, and so it is their job to lose, use their influence with the factories to um, in, in change certain, change, change the way things operate. Um, and specifically, they must require that the factories enable independent inspections, which the accord will do. 
remediate and repair defects, uh, continue to pay workers during the period of remediation, allow the employees to refuse unsafe work, and allow the accord to train uh, workers with unions um, on uh, health and safety commitment commi committees. I think the two critical commitments in the accord that will prove contentious and have been contentious, one is that the brands have to maintain volume in their factories for two years, and the second is they have to find or provide the financial resources for remediation. So with respect to, I know one of the questions that's been posed to us is about access to remedy. And so how does the accord address, the, address access to remedy? Um, we've heard a lot that it's binding, but who has uh, access to the remedial elements? And um, it's binding, but the, those who have standing to raise um, cases within the accord are the signatories themselves, which would include unions. And it is largely expected that unions will be the enforcement mechanism of the accord, although not necessarily required. Um, Bangladeshi unions included could could have access to the remediation. Um, but in effect, the it's not intended to create um, a separate remedial avenue for workers in Bangladesh for a whole range of human rights issues that might arise, like the denial of the right to organize or denial of you know being paid. And so it really is a narrow focus, and it really is about implementing um, requirements on the on the sourcing factories. So why is this a right then? Is this a right space for a multi-stakeholder initiative? Um, and does it make sense here? I mean, clearly, I think for brands and retailers, it is perfectly logical. They are sharing the same factories with one another. Mm -hmm. They're each in the past doing their own inspection. Now we're able to pool our resources. Uh, I think it's it's enabled them to create this level playing field, which is almost liberating in the in the sense of allowing real collaboration on how to fix real problems. In the past, um, they would have been in a much more competitive mode, maybe each with their own code of conduct, but still looking for the lowest price source that could get the job done, you know, within some constraints. So I think that from the a business point of view, it makes a lot of sense. I think also, however, without the unions at the table to provide the glue and the context, this agreement would not have emerged. Um, and certainly not a binding agreement. And I think this question of enforcement um, is, you know, clear that the some of these hard commitments that have been made would dilute over time. And, you know, we're already sensing, oh, do we really mean that? Well, we know that's what it says. But, you know, without having that balance of, of power, if you will, at the at the table, um, I think, you know, wouldn't be, we wouldn't be able to implement some of these harder commitments. So, so I do think having unions in the frame is important, not only from the point of view of enforcement, and that makes it sound like we're just there to, you know, keep the trains <laughs> running, but also um, as a voice for the millions of workers that are being affected by this. Um, and th th this is another, you know, important, important element. So, um, so I think it is the right place for multi-stakeholder, but again, I don't think this is a classic multi-stakeholder, and, and I think this is something to which unions will say, this is, you know, this is a really important example. We want to um, uh, make this succeed. I mean, clearly, that having an accord to inspect half the factories in Bangladesh is filling a governance gap that we would not, we don't see that as a, as a sustainable solution to the fact that the factories are unsafe in Bangladesh. We, not to say the accord should operate in Bangladesh for the next 20 years. We hope eventually that the government will take over this work, but faced with the governance gap, it does seem like the right response, and we're very determined uh, to make it work. And I think that businesses have shown tremendous um, commitment to this. Once they've you know, signed the accord, the spirit of work together has been um, really fabulous and, uh, you know, tremendous amount of work over the past six months. So thanks. Yeah. Uh, come back to the question about why not more unions. Okay. That could take another seven minutes. <laughs> Can I just ask you to take 30 more seconds on whether or not you see this as the beginning of a trend of unions becoming more involved? Why Bangladesh factory safety? Why not hours of work in China or – 
you know, harassment in Central America. Do you see this as a uh, test case, or is it really, is it sui generis, or is it the beginning of a trend? I mean, I think we're pretty clear that we would like to work with companies on all kinds of issues around the world. I mean, uni and industrial each have bilateral agreements with, I mean, we have 50 agreements with global companies that address all of those issues. Um, and certainly our policy is going forward, we would like those agreements to be increasingly become enforceable through an arbitration mechanism. And that, the clout moving towards enforceable global agreements is clearly a trend from perspective of uni. And again, we have 50 agreements with very large global companies. I think it's a special situation where you're doing multiple uh, companies in the, you know, it depends on the industry, depends on the market. Bangladesh presented a unique, unfortunately unique uh, crisis where, you know, because there was such incredible global outrage over the conditions there and it stood out in the extent of horror, there was a stronger impetus to do something um, collectively across a large number of companies involved. I don't, and we would like to say that we can use this model to address other issues because the question of health and safety is only the tip of the iceberg. There's questions of wages, there's, um, you know, so yes, we would like to, but, but uh, you know, I also am reluctant to say, oh yeah, we're going to roll this out across 20 countries. It's a huge amount of work to lift it over the past six months. So yes, we'd like to make it work and, and see where we could use it in other environments. And I particularly want to make the arbitration model work. We haven't set up, we're establishing an arbitration panel for um, uh, disputes that will inevitably arise under the accord. I think having an arbitration panel that could be also used to decide other disputes that we have with global employers could be a very useful model to develop. Thank you. Our uh, third and final uh, panelist here, if I can get this to work, is, um, uh, is Amelia Evans, uh, who's at the Harvard uh, Law School Institute for Multi-Stakeholder Initiatives. And she has been spent the last several years really diving in, looking at a range of multi-stakeholder uh, initiatives. Uh, Amelia, I want to ask you as you present your thoughts, um, uh, do, you, do you see a, uh, I know that you've, you've looked very hard and in detail at a lot of these uh, initiatives. Uh, can you give us a, a kind of interim view or broad view? Uh, do you see any hope for multi-stakeholder initiatives? I know you have a number of criticisms of them. Do you see uh, one that's working? What's, what's, what's the future hold here? Yeah, happy to, to get to that, Michael. Um, thanks, everybody. I think, you know, the last 15 minutes, the last couple of days, we've, we've actually had to absorb a lot of knowledge, do a lot of learning. Um, and I think we kind of deserve some kind of break, some kind of reward. Um, bar's not yet open, probably too early in the day. So I'm going to offer an intellectual reward. Um, and instead, for the next sort of seven minutes while I speak of you trying to think about all the things that you know about multi-stakeholder initiatives, I actually want you to sit back and reflect on the things that you don't know. Because I think in this space, this very kind of in some ways still new, but has actually been around for a decade space, there is a lot we don't know. Um, we don't know, for example, how many multi-stakeholder initiatives are out there. Uh, those who work in a particular industry have a sense of the initiatives that operate in that industry. So we've been hearing a lot about garments and apparel. But there's very little understanding of the global makeup. We also don't actually know because all of these initiatives have been in a response, a very well-meaning intended response, getting stakeholders together to respond to an industry-specific issue. All of them have actually been created sort of in this reactionary way often without any guidance of what would make a multi-stakeholder initiative effective. And that's one of the big questions today is, do we know whether and when multi-stakeholder initiatives can be effective? And as Michael has said, we're at the International Human Rights Clinic at Harvard Law School, we've been considering this issue for the last three years, done extensive, extensive literature review, discussion with practitioners, and actually decided to, to set up an independent entity. So I should clarify that the Institute for Multi-Stakeholder Initiative Integrity, as catchy a name as it is, is not based at Harvard Law School. It's, a, it's an independent organization that we set up this year to actually start sharing this information and trying to encourage better understanding of what, what's out there, what's working. Um, so 
We took what we learned through the clinic and we shared it publicly. We went to every single um, continent, got over 100 people to give us their thoughts, and we've come up with a tool that we will release next year. Um, we hope everybody in this room can use uh, to understand whether the initiative you're in or interested in is set up in a way that's effective. And that's from businesses who are genuinely committed to joining an initiative so that they can fulfill their responsibility and respect through to maybe those small NGOs who want to understand the strengths or weaknesses of an initiative that's operating locally. So some of, and, and, and the tool is actually simple. There's, there's seven basic categories. The tool goes into a lot more detail on each of them and I'll, and I'll run through them. They've mostly been covered off. So the first is you've got to have good standards. I think we will accept that. We'd say they have to be based in international law where that exists and a few other requirements. Second, we've heard a lot about good internal governance. Um, who are the decision makers? Um, as Christy said, the idea of an important balance of power amongst stakeholders and good decision making processes is absolutely critical. The third is implementation. How do you implement those standards? This is a huge section. We're talking about good independent monitoring, reporting, having grievance mechanisms so that you can actually file disputes, accountability mechanisms, where relevant to an initiative and it won't always be, appropriate learning, helping businesses to actually sort of systematically implement some of the policies that they've joined up to and often there's that huge gap. So is there assistance being offered um, to actually get implementation on the ground? And also outreach. Is there, are the actual rights holders in specific areas, the palm oil workers, um, the, you know, the communities living around mine sites, do they know about this initiative? Do they know of the rights that they have and, and the sort of recourse that's being afforded to them under it? Then beyond implementation and what's been talked about, I'd say there are sort of four other core areas. Um, one is the capacity to evolve. Can the initiative actually reflect on what's gone on? Are there built-in processes that require it to review how effective it's been, to expand, to, if it's been around for a decade, see how successful it has or has not been and evolve accordingly? How transparent is the initiative? Is this sort of the, the fifth category? Number six, and I think we've been, we've been talking about this, and I, that's encouraging to me, and that's what's the level of affected community involvement? Because... We're talking about sort of business not being in the room, and, and we do have unions, which is great, but actually the stakeholder that's often excluded, and I mean from governance level right through to implementation, is the rights holder. And is the rights holder actually participant uh, throughout that process? And finally, we ask the question of the mandate and scope. So does the initiative address the pressing human rights issues that prompted its development? It doesn't have to address all of them. Um, as Christy's indicated, you can actually choose something very narrow and focus on it. But is that what led to its formation? Is that being adequately addressed? So we're totally in early days. We're very reflexive. We're open to hearing more and more feedback as we gather more information to, to keep adjusting and refining this. We've done pilot studies of five MSIs. I'll quickly go through that. The Fair Labor Association, the Global Network Initiative, the Common Code for the Coffee Community, the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative and the Kimberley Process. If you haven't heard of all five, that's fine. You're probably not alone in the room. If you haven't heard uh, of one, you know, that's also probably not surprising either just because there's this plethora of what's out there. So we'll release next year a, a kind of a trend analysis of what we found across the five, but a sort of quick sneak peek. Um, one, as I've said, community um, involvement completely absent, really. Um, and the common refrain when we've actually engaged with most multi-stakeholder initiatives about why this is, is this idea that it's, it's sort of, it's too hard, it's too complex. And I'd sort of ask people to go back 15 years when the idea of business sitting alongside civil society was also seen as too hard and too complex and the gulf was just too wide. And yes, we've sort of, we've made incredible progress and there's no reason why we can't actually bring civil, we can't bring communities in in that same way. Yes, there may need to be capacity building, often there may not need to be. Um, and I would sort of push you saying, uh, Michael, is there a model out there, a sort of hope? Something that's pretty interesting and innovative, I would say, is what's hopeful. And so there are two things. One is, you know, I'm not an expert on the Bangladesh Accord, but I would say it is a multi-stakeholder initiative. It's just the reason we don't, we, we're shy to call it that, is that it has some of the features that seem more robust from what we've seen in the past. So it does have rigorous standards. It does have strict enforcement and accountability measures. It does have unions sitting at the table. And also the Council for Remotely Workers, which is actually a worker-driven MS for those of you who want to go out and have a look at it. 
Second finding, we've also been talking a lot about grievance mechanisms, um, and really great to hear that the two here have something. However, of the five we've looked at, uh, only two had a mechanism. And the guiding principles, principle 30, actually says all initiatives should have recourse to an effective mechanism. When we looked at the two that were there, unfortunately we found they didn't meet all of the criteria in the guiding principles around effectiveness. So there's a big leap to go, and obviously grievance mechanisms are extremely important. The third sort of issue, and there's a range of them, so wait for next year to get the full thing, I just say is the framing of human rights issues. Incredibly important. Often where there is international law such as that, um, referenced in Principle 12 of the Guiding Principles around the Bill of um, Human Rights and ILO conventions, they're not actually expressly incorporated. But I don't think the news is all dismal. I think that the Guiding Principles, there's been a lot of discussion of them being a floor, a foundation, not a ceiling. And multi-stakeholder initiatives, I think, provide some way for going beyond that. They're about setting often substantive standards. They've created a norm in which we should have monitoring and accountability. And the question is, can we just make all of those components effective and functional? Um, so here's a roadmap, I think, of what we might need to do and what MSI Integrity is doing. Three quick things. One is, I think we need to break down the isolation and siloing. We have to stop looking at the initiatives that are existing just within each industry and start to understand the good practices that are happening in other sectors. Uh, start to understand the lessons uh, from mistakes that have been made, unfortunately. So MSI Integrity really seeking to actually convene and bring together stakeholders across initiatives. Second is we need more awareness. We actually need to understand what are those initiatives that are doing well and what components are the leaders. We need to point to the innovative parts of particular initiatives. At the same time, we need to be honest and we need to acknowledge the parts of MSIs that are perhaps not functioning so well. Um, so MSI Integrity, again, using this tool, hoping to uh, both ourselves and others to start to actually create a little bit more of awareness of, of what's the range out there, who are the, the good players who are pushing things, versus those who are perhaps laggards. And finally, we need to get into the ground and understand impact. And this is perhaps the most challenging thing, not in multi-stakeholders alone, multi-stakeholder initiatives alone, but across the board in business and human rights. How do we actually go and talk to communities, talk to workers, and really understand what the impact in the ground has been? This is a much longer term project for us, but one that we hope is sort of helpful in getting there. So, I know time's up. If you're interested in all of this, hopefully we can we can go further at a later point. Thanks, Amelia. Um, and so now we have our two commentators who are going to um, react to some of the things uh, that have been said. Uh, Anne Marie Bazatu from the Geneva Center uh, for the Democratic Control of Armed Forces. Welcome. Thank you, and it, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. Is this working? Yes. Um, I, when I was asked to speak in this, they, I was um, sent several questions about basically on how multi-stakeholder initiatives can be implemented effectively. And in so doing, um, I'm reacting to what my panel is saying, but also talking a little bit about the work that we have been working on. Um, as uh, Mike said, I work for the Geneva Center for the Democratic Control of Armed Forces, or more easily said, DCAF. And for the last five plus years, we have been working on a multi-stakeholder initiative to um, help uh, hold accountable and regulate the private security industry. For those of you who have heard about it, um, it's the International Code of Conduct for Private Security Service Providers, which uh, was launched in January 2009 at the request of the private security industry itself. So when we talk about bringing industry into the room, um, they were definitely very much part of this initiative from the beginning. Um, they saw a need and they told us, or they told the Swiss government, that, that they needed to have uh, standards, clear standards that were based on human rights standards, and they had needed to have an effective accountability mechanism with teeth. So um, this, these were kind of the, the two main um, objectives that we had when we set out on this um, initiative, on this effort to try to develop First of all, clear human rights-based standards for private security uh, companies, and then some kind of mechanism with teeth to hold them accountable. Um, I'm, I was a little bit nervous when I heard Amelia start to name like the seven uh, points of what's an effective MSI, because I'm like, did we make them? Did we match them? And I'm actually pretty, I think we're doing okay. So we'll have to see, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll get in touch with you and find out in terms of 
the uh, how we met we match up on the scorecard but in terms of standards based on international law those are the ones that are at the heart of the international code of conduct they are based on human rights standards and and humanitarian law standards but through the lens of how they would be effective and applicable for uh, private security companies we have a I think a pretty robust and, oops, internal governance um, thank you projectiles over here um, we have a pretty robust internal governance system with a tripartite board of private security companies governments and human rights NGOs each with an equal uh, representation on the board so they're four members of each pillar and to have a vote for our voting structure is that in, for something to be approved you must get at least two uh, two stakeholders from each pillar to vote for something but with a total of eight out of twelve um, our pr prior experience with this kind of weighted voting in the past meant that actually votes didn't happen there was a pressure to reach consensus so we're kind of we're looking that maybe this will be the same thing and the steering committee that helped develop this it was a similar voting structure and they never actually came to a vote because the pressure was to reach consensus um, in terms I will speak just two minutes then on the oversight mechanism which is our implementation and hopefully our effectiveness um, part of this initiative and as I said the initial the initial um, request from companies was that we had something with teeth and what does that mean when you're talking about something that is a multi-stakeholder uh, government in which gov uh, governance structure in which governments have a role and part but in which is not really a governmental uh, type of governance and to be clear this is not a criminal uh, type of, of exercise it's not a criminal court it doesn't have those kinds of powers it does not replace state functions the point is where state functions are working where state does have effective control over its territory where it can hold private security companies to account this is, should be supported and hopefully the standards that have been developed through this exercise can also help inform them in the exercise of you know what does good security look like when it's provided by private security companies but it's still not meant to at all replace um, or interfere with any kind of state processes so I just want to make that clear however but it's in this case where as Mike said where you have a limited governance where the state isn't willing or able to do what it needs to do in terms of governance and this is where the the oversight mechanism is trying to to um, to play a role and at least provide some effective remedies to those who have had their their rights violated to the rights holders so um, we just launched this in September so it's a new um, a new initiative um, we have are not fully operational yet we're gonna need a little bit more time to get there hopefully in the next 18 18 months 18 to 24 months to be fully operational but there are three main functions of this oversight mechanism and one is a kind of certification that companies are in compliance to with the codes and with these human rights standards the second is a monitoring function which also includes monitoring in the field and interaction with rights holders and the third is a complaints system a way of handling complaints that hopefully um, will ensure that that uh, those who have had their rights violated get effective remedies so um, I will end my comment there just saying that you know these kinds of trends and we're seeing with what what everyone here on the panel said I mean there's so many interesting um, notes that I have even from the other panels discussions in terms of including the supply chain and and the clients are very important when you are trying to hold uh, companies accountable um, I'm really wanting to see this tool I wish we had had it at the beginning of when we had started this process because in 2009 we did not have a, a tool or really any kind of guidance for how do you do a multi-stakeholder initiative how do you do something that's effective for private security companies and um, so in terms of implementation we're hoping we're really going to try we um, we welcome of course any experiences also that you can offer because this is a learning process we are trying to evolve and um, with that I will end my comment thank you great thank you Andrew. Uh, our last uh, commentator is Mark Hodge from the global business initiative and Mark I'm going to ask you I very much hope you're going to comment on the other presentations rather than put new things into the mix so please go ahead 
Um, I'll try to. Uh, I, I think, uh, yes, I think what I've prepared and what I was asked to prepare will draw on, will, will, will in, in, in a sense be a, be a comment on the presentations. Um, so I'll try. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you to the organizers for, for inviting uh, me to be here on this panel. Um, my name is Mark Hodge, and I'm the executive director of the Global Business Initiative on Human Rights which is a collection of uh, global corporations working on implementation of the guiding principles. Um, I am the inadequate compensation, I think, for the, the business kind of voice on this panel. Um, I, we are not a multi-stakeholder initiative. We are a business-led initiative. Um, so uh, I have the nice position of being able to, to not deal with the complexities of running a multi-stakeholder initiative. So everything I say, um, I know I'm coming from a fairly easy external position. Uh, uh, so, you know, I really welcome the opportunity to speak today. I was kind of asked to talk about uh, company perspectives on multi-stakeholder initiatives, but I think also many of the panelists have already done that. Uh, from the members that we engage with, those that are engaged in MSIs find them incredibly useful as a learning platform, as a way to drive, drive performance, as a way to engage others in their sector that aren't part of those initiatives. So I think um, that's uh, helpful. Um, I think in my comments, though, I want to anchor a little bit in the guiding principles. Um, every time I speak about this business and human rights, I always quote the guiding principles now. I think I'm not sure people are reading them enough. Uh, again, we're not going back to them enough. And I think one of the most important sentences in the guiding principles can be found on page six, which is in the general principles. And, and, the, and the sentence says, these guiding principles should be understood as a coherent whole and should be read individually and collectively in terms of their objective to enhancing standards and practices with regards to business and human rights so as to achieve tangible results for affected individuals and communities. So as to achieve tangible results for affected individuals and communities. I think that that is a car in call for all MSIs. I entirely agree that governance, standards, accountability, implementation, learning is critical and key, but let's also not lose sight of the seventh category, mandate and scope. How do we get to outcomes? And my sense from companies I engage with is that the multi-stakeholder initiatives they're excited by and engage with are those that are actually driving outcomes on the ground and are putting energy into driving outcomes on the ground. And surely that's what we want from a human rights perspective. So my pitch is just to give a few illustrations now about what I mean by that. And then I'm going to close with a few questions uh, difficult. I was asked to comment on the role of MSIs in relation to the state duty to protect and access to remedy. I don't have any good answers to that, so I'll ask a few questions. Um, but first, I want to make the point about specific uh, issues. Um, yesterday, the topic of human rights defenders came up a lot. I think uh, what perhaps wasn't mentioned, that two of the most uh, largest multi-stakeholder initiatives, the Voluntary Principles and Global Network Initiative, came up uh, really in, in, uh, for the purpose of addressing violations of civil and political rights, actually of human rights defenders. Um, with GNI, uh, people that would be exposed to human rights activists through customer data being released to states, and in the case of the voluntary principle, security forces, public and private, not allowing people to protest peacefully. Very specific issues um, that involved state violations that companies were bec becoming complicit in. So I think that's just one example of a very specific industry item. Um, but I think where I see the most potential and some of the most exciting developments and where I see companies investing more of their time is to what I suppose I would call local MSIs, <coughs> multi-stakeholder initiatives that are focused on specific problems in specific geographies, and that has a huge benefit. You can engage the actors that can change that situation. You can engage the actual affected individuals and communities. And you can operate in a situation where there is specific jurisdictional realities that can change and shift. Yesterday, we heard about the Fair Food Program working in Florida with tomato growers and others in the supply chain. The Institute for Human Rights and Business and the Kenyan National Human Rights Institution have started the Nairobi process, engaging ex extractive exploration companies into the very issues early on in the, in the exploration phase. Um, in terms of oil and gas finds in East Africa, the International Cocoa Initiative I know is being spoken about, two countries trying to really get outcomes in that specific situation. And I think the OECD work around the due diligence for the guidance on conflict minerals, the implementation of that multi-stakeholder process, again, very specific, three Ts in the Great Lakes area. So I feel like that is where a lot of the energy is going 
and I think that's what companies are putting work into. So I'll, I'll end then with a question. Uh, I have a whole list of questions, but maybe I'll just uh, be shorter than I plan to be. Um, Mike, uh, as we get to this global order, um, and as we recognize consistently that these are interim solutions, I think I would be interested to hear from the panelists or those in the room, are there unintended consequences, unintended consequences here or not? To what degree can MSIs reinforce states' capability? To what degree, degree can MSIs reinforce social dialogue, access to remedy? Uh, yes, they're substitutes, but do they weaken that capacity or not? I hope, and I'm sure people on this panel have thought about it far more than I have, but I'd like to see MSIs not exist in 10 years' time because they've been able to build that capacity of other actors that should be playing this role. And what does that journey and transition look like? I know we're just building them, but I think we have to have one eye on that way forward too. Anybody on the panel uh, want to respond to this? Otherwise, we'll open it up. Peter? There's lots to, to think about, lots to respond to. Um, I, I would worry enormously if MSIs are seen as the solution, and often they're created, as, as, as Amelia said, as a response to something, uh, and often they're present because there's a vacuum. Um, certainly in our own conversations, and I believe it's the case in others, what we're trying to do is identify what is the root cause of the problem. Often it's, for example, there's no trade union presence. Um, so workers aren't able to argue for the conditions that they need. They're not able to put their case forward, and therefore you end up with audit and compliance mechanisms trying to be a replacement for that. They shouldn't be. So I think if, if whether MSIs are still the flavor of the month or not, um, if they're seen as a replacement as opposed to an irritant, if you like, they should be focusing on where is the... Where is the broken system? Is it government and policy? Is it a business practice? Is it um, a lack of capacity around civil society? We should be the enabler in that rather than the solution put in place. And, and the risk is business gets comfortable with these vehicles because they remove them from looking at their own direct responsibility. So I am not at all surprised to hear business is comfortable with the ones that deliver things. And that may be appropriate, but not if business is actually the problem. And again, we need to be very careful about what MSIs set themselves up to do. Um, are they the short-term solution to a problem, or do they then aggravate it by you know, becoming a barrier or a, a, a block to the wider change? You know, it's a good question. All right, let's open up to questions from the floor. Please, who's got the first question? Please identify yourself. Jermyn Brooks, Chair of uh, Global Network Initiative, and uh, thank you for, for mentioning that particular initiative a couple of times on the board, and thanks uh, to all of the panel for some very good comments. Um, particular thanks, uh, Michael, to you, because I know you were involved with the GNI long before I personally was and gave it inspiration, so thank you for that. Um, I, I just wanted to share uh, perhaps three points um, with our experience. Uh, the first is, and I think several of you talked about the journey that all of us have in complying with uh, the RAGI principles and human rights standards. And I think the MSIs are also on a journey themselves where they're finding out how to work together, how to develop uh, even the foundations on which they're based. Uh, for instance, I joined GNI the beginning of 2011. Uh, and basically, we established at that point um, a proper governance structure. We didn't really have a formal governance structure before then. Um, the, an, another point is the issue that um, each MSI has very specific characteristics. And if you're looking at, uh, as our last speaker said, at um, responses to very particular issues in particular industries, then it's very important in evaluating the effectiveness that those who are judging it really understand the problems in that industry. And uh, when we're talking about government um, surveillance or censorship, clearly there are very, very difficult issues which touch on one's ability to be fully transparent. Uh, and of course, one's pushing in that whole direction the whole time. That's one of the purposes of the multi-stakeholder initiative. Uh, but it means that the, you know, one of the criteria in respect of transparency has to be understood in the way that you explain your processes and what you're doing, but you're not actually talking about very specific issues on the ground, both to protect the people who might otherwise be harmed or sometimes uh, competitive interests. And I think the, the last thing which wasn't mentioned at all, 
uh, which unfortunately for us is important. I think you need um, sufficient independence in terms of financial resources, um, and I, I would suggest that uh, probably that needs to be put into the, the group, perhaps not of criteria, but of important considerations uh, about the effectiveness of any, of any um, multi-stakeholder initiative. Thank you. Yeah, just thank you, gentlemen. I think just to respond um, to maybe the last sort of two points there. One, just on the independent financing, absolutely. I think that, you know, that's certainly when you get into the detail on internal governance for us, that idea of where's the money coming from, um, you know, and is it creating conflicts of interest in some way? Is there transparency there? And then I think uh, the other question is, is there long-term funding available? I think that can be really helpful so that you can do that long-term planning. That's probably not something we'd say is an essential element, but more towards sort of good practice or innovation where you can get it. Um, I also completely agree that, you know, you obviously have to take in the context of each um, initiative. And, and every sector raises very unique peculiarities. Um, you know, and I think you can't get it to, to the best way to sort of understand those peculiarities is to, to talk with those who are involved in the industry. And I mean that from a multi-stakeholder perspective. So talk with business, talk with civil society, talk with government where relevant, and talk with affected communities. Um, I know that in our methodology going forward, we're going to propose that you know, to, to give an MSI a reflection of its transparency, we do an evaluation first based on the publicly available material and then give that to the MSI to show before releasing it publicly in any way and then sit down and talk with that stakeholder group and actually reflect on what we've written to actually understand that context well before releasing anything publicly so you get the benefit of, of both worlds. Um, I think our the plan here is to have one question from civil society, the next from business. I just want to show of hands, how many people here are from a business? Lawyers keep your hand down, consultants keep your hands down. Okay. Who in that, who, who among those who raised their hand has a question? Please. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Adam Green uh, with the U.S. Council for International Business. I guess a question on the, uh, to Amelia on the integ MSI integrity uh, criteria, um, so of the MSIs I've been involved in, the real key to effectiveness has been things that have been much softer than sort of criteria like that, including trust, commitment, goodwill, shared objectives, um, a collaborative approach, and, uh, and, and the, the one most recently or currently is the OECD uh, ICGLR. UN program on conflict minerals. Uh, it does not have some of the elements that are there. It has most of them, but the real power of it is is those much softer aspects of, you know, very group, you know, very diverse groups, but with very uh, shared commitment uh, and trust and goodwill. And that's really where the power of it comes from. Uh, and I guess that comes to the question of how you measure effectiveness. Um, it's in our minds very effective, um, but again, it's not necessarily a sort of technical check of, of does it do all the all the other things. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Adam. Um, uh, absolutely, I think we all recognize that those kind of qualitative features like trust, um, engagement, and dialogue are really important. Um, we can't capture them by giving everybody a tool, but one of the things that we expect is that where you have that trust, where you have that willingness, where you have that discussion, that should translate into change on the ground. Um, and sometimes that will be evidenced by what sort of rigor the MSI actually produces in terms of the toolkit. But I think, you know, the real question is, can you get that translation onto the ground? And so where you've got an MSI, I think that deviates from the pattern and is really about sort of building trust among stakeholders. I think the duty is on that initiative to really have an independent body going into the, going in to, to affected communities and asking, is this trust? Is this improvement in company practice? Is this, un this better understanding of NGO of the complexity of the reality of, of what's going on, is there a translation? And actually seeing what sort of change um, is, is happening on the ground in that way. Um, 
you know, the best that we can do to try to capture that atom is when we actually talk and meet with multi the actual initiative itself is try to capture some of that and put it in a report. So the way that we anticipate doing this is that there's a short sort of five-page document mm -hmm. which goes through the tool when we're using it, but a longer form report that might try to touch on some of those more very important qualitative features, but still not walk away from the overall question of um, the question I think Mark asked, which is, you know, is there that kind of protection of human rights on the ground? Is that the end result that those qualitative features is leading to? Okay. Um, last thing. Who in the government? Who in the government wants to ask a question? How many are here from government? Why? Very good. Okay. Please. Hi. Um, Jason Pilmar from the uh, U.S. State Department, I head up the business and human rights team there and uh, work closely on the voluntary principles and the International Code of Conduct, a couple of the initiatives that have been mentioned. Um, the question I'll ask is uh, for the panelists uh, about civil society participation, because one of the issues um, that we've uh, we faced uh, in multi-stakeholder initiatives uh, is both on how to uh, draw civil society participation uh, and how to define civil society. Um, so uh, it gets apart at the questions about financing because I think civil society oftentimes is the least resourced of the three actors that are typically pulled into these kinds of initiatives. Um, but if the funding comes from industry, whether directly or indirectly, or from states, then it creates questions of uh, conflicts of interest. Um, and so without some sort of third party like a foundation or someone else who's willing to sort of sponsor civil society participation, uh, it gets uh, it gets tricky. Um, and so I was curious if uh, in your experiences you've seen um, good ways to address those kinds of, of issues um, and, uh, and going forward if you think foundations who I think have been rather absent from uh, this conversation um, are, are likely to sort of peak up their interest and get more involved. It also goes to the point about sustainable independent funding, which I was nodding internally to. Um, there's no doubt about it that, that a f civil society is more effective if it is um, independently resourced. And, and it's, it's a psychological thing as much as a practical thing. I mean, I think, you know, the serious civil society actors are never going to be directly influenced by um, money at the table. But it does affect how the power plays out. And there are some foundations stepping into this space, but probably not enough. There's still a lot of traditional development money going in traditional development avenues. And there probably is an opportunity for civil society to explore how can we get this participation funded? How can we get support for being the conduit for voice, not just um, you know, participation at the, at the governing governance level, but active participation at the ground. And again, we find that that we have fairly well-resourced NGOs around our table in, in the UK and fairly well-resourced global unions, but as soon as you get down to a Bangladesh or southern India or a Peru, well, just the resources to get on a bus to come to a meeting suddenly become a problem. So how do we get that if we want to drive active participation that's not a client relationship because they're part of a project funded either by the MSI itself or by industry? It's definitely a challenge that we're facing. One uh, just editorial comment from the chair. There are my experience is there are two kinds of civil society participants. One are what I would call operational, and they often get funding from government or funding from companies to operationalize, which is a useful function, but it's very different from the advocacy policy NGOs. And I think in the governance structure, you need both. You certainly need the advocacy policy voice there so that there really is a perspective that's, and that's often missing. Other, okay, we're back to opening the floor. Did you have a yeah. Paul Redfern here. Uh, I have a question for the panelists, but I'll, I just need to introduce it. When I moved from the ILO to the Fair Labor Association 13 years ago, we all agreed that this was a stopgap measure, that it was filling a governance gap. As I'm stepping down 13 years later, I don't see us being any closer to filling that governance gap. In fact, it seems to have gotten larger. And so I'd like to ask the panelists how they see success. What is, when would you say that you've actually achieved what you set out to achieve? And 
in answering that, I'd, ask, I'd like to ask you to address all the elements of the governance gap, because I think we quite often look at a component of it, like labor inspection or something like that. But I think the governance gap is actually quite diverse. It includes corruption, legitimacy, accountability, the asymmetries in the power relationships in the country, in the supply chain, in the industry, and so on. So I'd be interested to see how you, so you see yourselves um, addressing those and progressing against those. Well, just to speak to the question of a little bit what's happened in the past and why that hasn't worked and how we, that to some extent, has given rise to the accord, because I think there is among, certainly among labor and even more broadly in the literature, um, an acceptance that some of the models in the past have completely failed. If anything, they have only given credence to we're trying our best, but still the question of inspections, the social audits, and the, the um, brand's uh, own inspection industry. It's a $5 billion industry, but in fact, you know, factory after factory has fires and they've just recently been inspected and given a clean bill of health. So we need to do something different, that's clear. Um, I think, again, that literature has been pretty strong that some of the softer approaches from the past haven't really addressed the fundamental problem. In terms of how we see achieving sustainability, certainly from the union side, from the accord, we want the Bangladeshi government to assume its role as to be responsible to actually inspect factories. The brands need to understand that you can't continue to source in Bangladesh and pay the amount that you do and not have workers in unsafe factories. There is a fair pricing argument that the Bangladeshi government and the industry always raise, and, and the fundamentals are the price and the product. I mean, you get what you pay for, and we can't continue to have clothing that, that is as cheap as it is um, if workers don't want to be working in death traps. So I think there, there is an element of that over the long term is, you know, raising the, um, the um, standards across the board in Bangladesh, and I think the court can be part of that, getting the government to take on its responsibility. But fundamentally, we also see the, the creation of uh, collective bargaining and, and organized workers at the workplace as being key to having any kind of safe environment and to achieving the other human rights um, in that country, which are um, you know, having, a, having a decent wage and so on. So I think there's, there's different elements. I'm not addressing the corruption issue because I realize there's, that's not my, my specialty by any means, but I do think that there's a full range of, of kinds of issues that have to be um, addressed over the longer term in order to create a sustainable business model there. I just want to push you a little bit, Christy, on this. We held a meeting at Stern at NYU in September on Bangladesh, a closed door meeting, and we brought together manufacturers from the country, the government, NGOs, et cetera, unions, and we had the big brands there in the Western governments. And one of the things that was really striking was both with the Accord and the Alliance, which we haven't talked about, and I know there are differences, we're not going to get into that, but neither one, there was really a sense of disempowerment of the government. The government really didn't know what was going on. Um, and frankly, the local manufacturers weren't involved. They all said to us, they complained quite bitterly, these agreements are arranged in Geneva or London or New York, and then they tell us this is what we're doing. So how do you deal with that? You mentioned that you have industry participation on the board. Where's the local participation? How do you deal with that question? That's a good question. Um, the industry factory participation, the sourcing, the sourcing participation is located in the advisory board in Bangladesh. Now, I think when you had the meeting in September, I mean, clearly we had just launched the alliance a few months before. Um, we were just you know, putting our governance together. So this was very early in the stage. But the, quite, the truth is the Bangladeshi government has said from the beginning, we want to be at the table. Why aren't we? They have said that they felt disempowered. Um, and we're addressing that to some extent through the relationships. We now have someone on the ground in Bangladesh. We will soon, we have two executive, two high level people now on the ground in Bangladesh and we'll be building out a team of inspectors. Um, in my recent meeting with the Bangladeshi government, they said, here's the pie chart, you take this half and we'll take the other. Um, and so I think they're seeing us as a resource to help them get the job done. They don't have the capacity to inspect 3,500, 4,000 factories. And so 
they've actually asked us to just take on half and they'll do the other half. Um, will there be conflicts? Yes, I'm sure there will. There's ultimately going to be a conflict about the authority of the accord to, in, in effect, shut down a factory um, by withdrawing orders, which it's not the same thing as having the government shut down a factory, but the consequence is the same. And I think they, they would like to retain that power, the, the ultimate decision within the government, which we're not willing to concede. I think, you know, these are things that will have to get worked out over time. Certainly the, the BGMEA, which is the Employers Association, of the Garment Manufacturers Association, would like to have a voting role on the steering committee, and, and they don't. And so, um, you know, that's a conflict we've had to deal with. But at the end of the day, they have every um, reason to work with us, and we have every reason to work with them, and we're, you know, just developing that relationship as, as time goes on. But we're inspecting 1,800 of their members, so it will, <laughs> it will get there. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, next question, please. My name is Catherine Hagen. I am also a former ILO uh, employee who has moved into a different kind of setting of multi-stakeholder engagement. That is to include governments, international organizations, and civil society and private sector in an informal setting in our global social observatory, which has been operating here in Geneva. Uh, one of the initiatives that we've engaged in most recently is in support of, a, of another movement called the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, which was launched uh, from the United Nations with support from donor governments and recipient governments, as well as civil society and the private sector. And sort of one of the basic questions I have of the panel is to what extent must these multi-stakeholder initiatives be some things that are targeted at developing country governments, and to what extent can they be created as multi-stakeholder engagements that make it possible for civil society and the private sector to support what governments need to be doing in the area of human rights. Uh, one of the things that we've encountered in our support for the Scaling Up Nutrition movement is that we are helping to develop a sort of reference note on how to deal with conflict of interest issues in this particular setting. And uh, this has been raised by one of the panelists already, that there is a challenge with regard to conflict of interest, and it would be helpful to hear your observations about that particular concern as well. So it's, I'm actually just going to build on the question, and I guess it's a very simple one, is I hear often that MSIs exist to address second pillar sort of responsibility to respect issues. Are MSIs uh, there or not to address all three pillars? Are they there to build state duty to protect and access to remedy, or are they just about second pillar responsibilities? And to have the guiding principles helped have a conversation with governments about the ways in which they can meet their state duties. You know, has that helped with the Bangladeshi government? Has that helped with others or not? Is that a roadmap you know, for us? Um, such, such great questions. Um, so I think for me, uh, in the work that we've done, we've found that the jury's very out on where the government should be formally involved in multi-stakeholder initiatives. There seems to be arguments both ways. You know, bringing in government in a formal way um, obviously has a range of huge advantages. You tend to be better well-resourced. You have direct you know, necessary connections to legislative action. You have big convening power. Uh, some of the issues that seem to be raised sometimes is that bringing governments in at that formal decision-making level sometimes sort of highly politicizes the process. Um, the Kimberley process is a classic example of that, where it's uh, so much emphasis on government and it becomes a space in which all other geopolitical issues, you know, get brought to the table. So I think the question is, uh, you know, I absolutely think that you, you need to be thinking about this in terms of the state duty to protect. And I think a lot of why MSIs are developed is because of the governance gap, which we've raised. And that can be because of an absence of domestic law um, or it can be because of an absence of enforcement. So I think you do need to have government engagement in some way. I guess the, it's a very much a question of 
of the actual context, coming back to German's point, I think, of what that government involvement should look like. Should it just be that there's a connection in some way more to do with implementation, or should it be that formal decision-making role? I think that's really a contextual question. Um, I would just sort of point in terms of coming back or at very quickly, which relates to this in terms of success, and I would say the success is sort of closing that gap and addressing the root cause of why the initiative sprung off. I know that's kind of a cop-out in some ways, but you know, you are seeing some movement towards that, and I would point to the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative as a kind of interesting thing in the sense that we, you had actually legislation from the US and the European Union, even though they weren't formal members of the initiative, that in some ways through Dodd-Frank and regulation seemed to be kind of actually closing that governance gap without joining the initiative at that point. So kind of an interesting development in terms of closure. MSI is not all the same, so I think we need to be, be a little bit careful um, as we deal with this. In, in our own thinking, um, in the last two or three years, we've, we've definitely gone from, uh, on the same concerns that Rhett has, um, yes, we've seen change, particularly in first-tier factories, where companies have a lot of presence, a lot of visibility. FLA has done great work. I think ETI members have done good work. But have we tackled the underlying causes around governance, and why didn't we? Um, have an impact on the chronic issues in Bangladesh. And that's because we were not looking at the underlying causes, we were looking at the symptoms. So ETI in its own thinking has, has gone into this space of saying it, it's not just about companies doing things, it's about leveraging companies' ability to get a political debate. Um, one of the reasons we were very supportive of the accord was that it points directly to the National Action Plan and it has ILO as the chair. And those are quite important statements and while I have sympathy for the local Bangladeshi stakeholders, let's be clear about this. There was a fire in 2005. They did nothing in the interim. So for them to say it's not fair at this stage is rather laughable. The way the accord is designed was to get the international stakeholders in a focused way to interact with the government. And I think the sort of commitment we've, we've heard about and the spirit should deliver that. I mean, I think that's one of the measures is does it deliver engagement locally? Um, so I think any MSI worth its salt should be not just focusing on are we part of the remedy piece, but are we actually looking at what are the under underlying causes here? How can we use our stakeholders, whether that includes government or not, to influence the things that are preventing change, not just put the sticking plasters on the, you know, the symptoms that we see? And I think that is, you know, if you like, the evolution of our thinking in this area so that we do work ourselves out of a job um, and not just do another 10 years of um, similar work and similar projects and look back and wonder why we haven't tackled the governance issue. Okay. Okay, Chip Pitts from Stanford. Uh, I'd like to pick up on the theme of several of the last speakers. I have the same sense that Orit does about, you know, having been involved in a lot of these multi-stakeholder initiatives, uh, and some of the best ones that are changing results on the ground, which is exciting. I'm also, I have a sense that the 10 or really more 15, 17 year process has sort of reached its limits in some ways. And that's why we're seeing a rise of the, of the accord and these new approaches. Um, my question is really, you know, I, I fear that Amelia's initiative is welcome as it is. I mean, that's what we need, that sort of thinking on criteria, but it risks being, um, you know, sort of this ideal sketch that, as Kevin and several others have said, isn't really reflective of the actual reasons the MSIs came into existence, which is often reactive to a particular situation, often, frankly, to give, uh, you know, some immediate crisis relief to a, to a scandal, right? That's the origin of many, perhaps most, of these initiatives. Um, and so my question is really, what in practice, and this is really a question for Mike Posner um, or Jason, if he's willing to opine on it, you know, what are governments doing with leading businesses to actually have a path to addressing the root causes in a more effective way? And that requires an MSI of MSIs, of which there are some, like ICEAL, for example, you know, but I feel like a lot of the other MSIs, uh, and this is the conflict of interest issue. And frankly, you know, Christy, as, as, as excited I am about your involvement in the, in the MSIs, you know, it's a, a perspective. Each stakeholder, business or the unions, think they have the answers. And often they're compelled by their position to say, you know, this is the answer. But, you know, for these to be effective, I found what's ultimately needed is a real opening up of the need for these interest perspectives to complement each other. And so we need to you know, have ways of transcending the old, old ways. So we really do start to achieve scale and outcomes and impact. So that's my question. What's happening on the intergovernmental level, perhaps with some of the leading businesses and uh, you know, civil society organizations? Mm 
uh, and to the extent you can actually get the right holder's perspective locally. Uh, Jason off the hook here. As, now that I'm not in the government, I can speak freely. Um, I, I think there is a shift going on in governments, frankly, from essentially a boosterism of local industry um, to beginning to think about what's the broader role of, of big companies, big national companies, I mean home companies uh, in the world. It's certainly true in the U.S. government. We spend a lot of time trying to pull into the Human Rights Bureau, Democracy, Human Rights, Labor, some of these issues saying it's absolutely right that there's a Commerce Department and a Treasury Department and Trade Representative and Labor Department. But let's, and a Economic and Business Bureau, but let's try to figure out ways in which we can push companies to do more. Um, I think it's also critical in some of these MSIs that you bring in foreign governments. And one of the things we really tried to do, I spent untold hours in places like Libya and Nigeria and Colombia trying to get local governments to participate in the voluntary principles. The voluntary principles won't succeed if the government of Nigeria is not part of it, frankly. Um, and that isn't to let Shell or Chevron off the hook. They, sh they have huge responsibilities. They should be doing more. But at the same time, the government is a major player in that. So I think it's partly to push to have a more honest view of what companies, national companies do, not just to provide exports and to improve balance of payments, but to think what are their responsibilities. And Jason and others are still doing that at state. But I think we've got to really be smart about also saying, for example, with the extractive industries in the Congo, Dodd-Frank has some reporting requirements. We put report, reporting requirements for Burma, Myanmar, any company doing business. And again, pro-business, but saying let's be open and honest about what are the responsibilities. I think, sadly, the European Union and OECD and all sorts of others are balking at the notion of having reporting requirements for Burma, for Myanmar. Why is that? I don't know. ASEAN, same thing. So I think there's really room for governments to do a lot more practically, both to open up the space, to push their own companies, and to push other governments to behave better. Please. I just want to comment that in, in um, developing the governance system for the code of conduct, one of the things that has been a little bit challenging that we've heard governments balking is that they have only one third of a three partite governance. They have they're they're at the same uh, on par with gov with uh, companies and with NGOs, and some states have have balked at that. Um, although the the membership is growing, and we have more states that are coming in, we have actually kind of two levels of state adherence. Um, so one is more of a member, and one is more of an advisory function. But um, it is an it's a different uh, way for states to think about how they interact with with non-state actors and with these challenges. So, please in the back. Thank you, Steve, Stephen. O, Social Accountability International. Um, I want to insist on on, on on the point that you made earlier, Chair, about um, worker involvement. There are many of us who would be very happy to have greater worker involvement. We ask for it, we seek it, and yet the unions are not finding the resources to participate for whatever reason, and I appreciate that unions are under financial pressures as well. But um, I'm going to come out as a former ILO official as well. Um, I, it's not normal to me not to have unions at the table, and yet often this is what we are faced with. It's distressing to find that criticism of, of um, MSIs from unions when we should be pulling in the same direction. And um, with all due respect to unions who are, who are colleagues, um, I think that uh, they are themselves, if we wanted to do that, open to criticisms because it's fair enough to say that um, MSIs have failed, that social auditing has failed, but um, please show us where are all the successful countries where you get collective agreements. Tell us how many collective agreements and how many workers are covered by those. Please also tell us, and this should be the first line of defense, how many countries have good labor inspection systems which, which are applied, uh, which, where the legislation is applied. I thought Imokali yesterday made a very good point about um, 
uh, different stakeholder group, and this was about involvement of the consumers, and I would like to hear more about that, as well as the, the involvement of governments, because if you're going to be an MSI, you want all of these people involved. Thank you. Well, first, I just want to say on this question of 1% of 1,700, that says there's 17 of us here, which, frankly, that speaks more to the, the 1,600 other people who are here other than the paucity of unions because we're small at the global level, and I think the fact that we do have – there's a fair number of – people involved at the policy level of various global union organizations who are present here today. Dwight Justice is here from the ITUC. Uh, we have our colleagues from TUAC in the room next door. I've had my colleague from Industrial speaking on a panel. So we are here, and unions do think that the guiding principles have been an incredible landmark event in the, in the whole development of human rights work and businesses. So we take it seriously. We teach human rights. We teach the guiding principles to our members. We always have programs on it. We've produced literature. It's just that we don't, frankly, to participate in every conference to which we get invited, it's, it's simply impossible. Um, uh, and um, so there's a question of resources. I would also say that um, we are constantly fighting the battle to see that the human rights of workers, in, especially in connection with freedom of association, are given the same level of um, attention as many other human rights violations. And, and two panels that I attended yesterday, the panels listed the human rights to which they thought were important, and they mentioned child labor and forced labor, of course. Uh, but no mention of any others, and that of any others concerning workers. And I think that's, you know, uh, certainly something that we're tackling all the time when it comes to human rights. Um, and it's – we need to be here in order to raise our voice on that question, and there's no doubt about it. You don't – you know, the subject's not put on the table. But it is also um, – it's also certainly, I think, something that may be a deterrent for, for some unions from participating and why unions don't participate as much as you might like for in the various MSIs that are, that are involved. I think, just frankly speaking, often unions see that they're there so that groups can say we are a multi-stakeholder, we have unions at the table, but they have no real influence or power, and that's therefore not a useful way to spend their time. Um, we just don't, you know, we don't want to, you don't want to have a union at the table so that you can represent that your group is truly taking on board um, labor issues if, in fact, that isn't happening. And, and it is true that we've withdrawn from another, from a number of, um, uni has withdrawn from a number of MSIs in the past year where we felt that we just don't have the resources to continue to attend meetings without actually um, playing a more meaningful role. So I can't speak for the other, um, the other unions, the other global unions in that regard, but my impression is that their experience is similar. So. I'm Catherine Kisejian from the University of Paris. Um, I would like to, I'm sorry for the interpreters, but I'm going to speak English. I think I'm better understood if I speak English than French. Um, I would like to stress that um, we have been talking a lot about what I call a north-south divide, but I think we also have a problem in the north, quote-unquote the north. And as I see the evolution of our markets in the north, I also see a lot of the diminishing of the labor rights all around, and I'm speaking just for Europe uh, for a minute. So we have to think in terms of what it means to what we are projecting to the other countries in the South in terms of uh, the protection of labor. That's my first point. My second point is that in terms of um, multi-stakeholders initiatives, I think it must be based I'm, – I'm very concerned that we are just um, kind of portraying that only soft solutions or processes are enough, and I don't think that's true. I think we have to be very uh, clear on um, the conjunction, the collaboration between hard law remedies, both in courts and arbitration, as it was said before, and soft law and soft processes. 
and mediation. So we have to find a way to actually make those two elements work together and not in opposition or in competition. My name is Dwight Justice. I'm with the International Trade Union Confederation. And believe it or not, I'm, I'm not a former ILO official. <laughs> um, uh, just a few thoughts, but I guess my main thought now is to, to respond to Stephen Oates a little bit on the MSIs and labor practices. Uh, it is true that they have not had much effect if you look at the actual situation of work in, in labor-intensive manufacturing and, and agriculture. Uh, but, what is, but that is not necessarily directly related to the MSIs, it, but there are many reasons why, why working conditions in, in these areas have continued to deteriorate. Uh, the, 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 I think what part of the problem is, is although MSIs it can be said to be addressing a governance gap. Uh, they aren't the gap. They're not the thing that's going to fill it itself. I mean, if you take ETI, the purpose of ETI was to examine by its critics, the unions and the NGOs that were critics of the companies who had codes and they didn't seem to be doing things with their codes, to examine what they should do with their codes. Now, even if this whole thing worked out very well, that isn't going to fill the governance gap. But ETI was never uh, created to go into the deep root causes of something like a developmental agency. That's, that's not, it was never intended to do that, and it could not possibly succeed if it tried. Um, a couple of things about unions and representation. Trade unions are built for representation. That's why they were created. That's what they do. And the situation that you have is depending upon what you want to do, you will have the correct trade union organization to represent workers in a given situation, whether it's on the local level, by an enterprise, by a region, nationally, internationally, by sector, uh, or, or this or that. I mean, you, you have this structure. And, uh, and, and, and unions are very sensitive to the issue of who speaks for workers and who represents workers in, in a specific context. And uh, one, of, one of the things that, okay, I'll stop there. We're very sensitive about who speaks for workers. All right. I, I want to just take two minutes, literally, to summarize a couple of things that I've heard. And this is obviously uh, my own um, biases undoubtedly come in here. But I think we started out with a uh, a strong sense, which is reinforced by the panel, that we are in a, transi a constantly transitional period here where the goal is to build stronger governments. The goal is to have uh, a go at the root causes of some of the problems we've talked about today. Um, we ought to keep our eye on the long-term objective of strengthening local governments and local institutions and local actors. Um, that's a long-term goal, and I think all of us recognize that in the here and now, there's going to need to be a range of things that are short-term, mid-term uh, responses to real problems that are affecting real people. It's also true, and what goes along with it, is that the MSIs are not a permanent fixture. They deal with an interim situation, perhaps a crisis situation. As Chip said, some of them are created out of crisis. But the goal here is to try to make the most of those situations. I don't agree with the assertion that they've um, seen their better day. I think they're going to evolve. The Accord and the Alliance represent a response to a new kind of a crisis, and they're a work in progress. And I think christie has been very honest in saying we're trying to figure out how to do this, and we're trying to make it better for the workers of Bangladesh. That's admirable. It's to be supported. We're going to see other things like the Code of Conduct for Private Contractors, a new field. There are plenty of new fields where this sort of thing can be done. I want to go back to Adam Green's point. I think he's now left. But the notion of trust is really critical. And I think the challenge here is to develop a framework that allows trust, but at the same time has real standards and real accountability. And you can't do this without business. I said it at the beginning. 
but business has to be at the table. If they're not there and they don't feel invested in it, it's not going to work, but they need to be pushed to go beyond their comfort zone. So the question is, how do you get trust but accountability? How do you have real standards in different industries that actually put the real issues on the table, help them implement the standards, but at the same time recognize when there's noncompliance, there's a cost. This is the remedy point of the guiding principles. And finally, I do think we need to look at these things industry by industry, uh, and even country by country. There is no one magic solution here. And if the guiding principles provide a broad foundation, we now have to go much more specifically to look at places, issues, industries, and really try to come up with this framework. Thank you to the panelists. You've done a great job. Thank you to the audiences. We are done. Thank <laughs> you.